things. Uh, let us uh, start our morning uh, session with the talk of Arthur Avila from CNRS, uh, Poincaré, and uh, the normalization theory. Uh, <laughs> Thanks uh, for uh, the opportunity to talk in this uh, special occasion. Um, and I uh, was a bit uh, concerned about how to, to make the presentation, and I hesitated a little bit finally. Uh, I wait a little bit to mention uh, to, to talk something of Poincares, and uh, just kind of it would be easier to, to talk a little bit about renormalization so, so that you're not too tired when I get to it. And, uh, and uh, in a few minutes, not, not longer, Poincaré will come in. And uh, so the basic uh, object that, that we're going to consider, I'm not going to introduce renormalization in general, but just the concept of uh, renormalization fixed point will be necessary in this talk. So for, for us, it will be just a, a Lamarck function, F, so F the Lamarck function, uh, satisfying a functional equation which is, uh, so you have some, some Olmark function f in some, uh, some place, or something like that, so some iterate of it applied to some, uh, there is some kind of scaling factor lambda, if such, if given uh, just such f uh, is lambda. Yes. So if you look at, so lambda is some factor uh, less than one, so if you want to look at, so you have some iterate uh, with kind of in a smaller scale uh, of that, if it's the same as the first iterate in the, the original scale, then you rescale it. And then, uh, so this is just a Lamarck function. Uh, of course, you have to define the domain. You're not going to be considered the maximal analytic extension that you could have of such a, such a function, but uh, we assume that it has some specific configuration somewhere so there is a special point that uh, that's zero with the, the scaling around zero. So uh, there's a critical point at zero. And there is a, the transformation takes some disk, some topological disk around zero and goes to a bigger disk at a degree two mass. So there's a critical point of degree two here and then there is a degree two with proper mass. So we have this covering. Uh, and so if you have such uh, a transformation like this, then uh, satisfying such an equation, then you get this, uh, so P is some iterate bigger or equal than two, it's an integer, and uh, this will be a renormalization fixed point. So you are going to be, uh, you, you may ask whether such a renormalization fixed point exists, and it's possible to show that for every P bigger or equal than two, there is at least one Renormalization fixed point uh, for two, there, there is a p equals two. There is exactly one, and for uh, larger p uh, modulo conform of uh, affine change of, trans of, of coordinates, for larger ones, uh, there is so for all the, that. So this, so this is a functional equation that uh, lambda is some scaling factor that's fixed for some. So the transformation in a small scale it behaves exactly as the same under this kind of thing. So renormalization is the operation that, uh, that makes this rescaling thing and this uh, iteration, this says that the renormalization is exactly the same as the original mass. Um, so uh, what's interesting, uh, this, those are very interesting for, for several reasons. We can try to, in, uh, try to understand what's the repercussion of all these uh, uh, kind of uh, copies of the own dynamics that are of large scales that appear in smaller scales and this gives a very rich picture. Traditionally, everything started, uh, why people started analyzing this was because they just discovered the, the arising connection with some uniperfectalic phenomena that was was first seen uh, in real dynamics, and those are going to be complex extensions of those real dynamics, which is the Feigenbaum uh, coulet tresset phenomena that's kind of uh, gives, uh, is explained in this picture that maybe some of you have seen, which depicts in a family, here is a family of quadratic maps with some parameterization. In the horizontal X, you have the uh, parameter, and in the vertical X, you have the actual phase space, the, the space where you iterate. And it shows the, uh, the attractor of the system, where are the orbits of the system, as if you iterate, they are going. And originally, in the left side, you have a very simple attractor, it's just a fixed point. Then it gets kind of mildly more complicated, becomes a period of period two. There is a attractor has two points, 
and then it gets more and more complicated, and it's very complicated at, at the point where it's an initial one, two, four, and so on, and this is, is a finite set, and suddenly it's kind of much more complicated. This moment where it's kind of uh, becomes infinitely complicated for the first time is uh, related, is, is something that uh, corresponds to a dynamics that's a deformation of a randomization fixed point and the behavior, uh, the, the quantitative features of how you approach uh, these uh, special parameters are related to uh, precise the, the, the properties of the randomization fixed point, in this case of the randomization fixed point of period two. Okay, so now, uh, so this is in real dynamics. To understand those real dynamics, you are led to understand co the complex dynamics of systems, or you can be interested just by themselves. This would lead to some pictures of the Mandelbrot set that I'm not going to show. But uh, if you look at the complex dynamics, you are going to be interested on, so, so here you have map, so the domain is not the same as the range. So there are points that escape, and then you cannot iterate anymore. So what you define are the set, uh, the, the actual dynamics happens at the set of points which, uh, uh, some, some complicated set of points here that I, I'm going to show soon, are the points that never escape under iteration. So uh, formally you have this kind of Julia set that's going to be the intersection of the frame image of the, so you have the domains U and V and the frame image of U. So, uh, so you have this Julia set that's at where the actual um, dynamics is going to take place for all times. And uh, so I have pictures of this uh, kind of uh, close to the Julia set for a randomization fixed point, <coughs> or at least uh, as close as I got from it. Here's uh, one picture of uh, this randomization fix fixed point at some scale. So it looks like this. Actually, you only see a little bit from the outside. The actual thing should be in black in that picture, but the colors get kind of changed as they get close to, the, to that. So this is one picture that you get, and then uh, at some scale, and then if you look at the Next scale, you get another picture in a smaller scale. You get a picture like this. Maybe I don't do the, the whole procedure of getting a full slide, but you get some picture like this. It's more complicated, and you see the colors getting very approaching there. And then you look at the next scale. Oops, I jumped in the wrong one. So this should be the intermediate scale, so that is a kind of still a little bit uh, tension. And the other one was uh, the, a, a slightly smaller scale. Not this one, let me just use this. This is the final scale, where it's already very, very complicated. The, uh, so this is uh, this behavior that you saw that uh, as you kind of uh, um, zoom in, you get more and more complications. It's no normal because when you get closer to a critical point, you actually have interaction of the dynamics in several different scales. So you have copies of the dynamics, of the same dynamics in any scale, because you can kind of uh, repeat this equation and, uh, for different lambda. So at every lambda n, uh, you are going to have the, uh, a new copy of your dynamical system. You have some kind of interaction between uh, dynamical systems at all scales. And this reflects, for instance, in a theorem of McMullen that says that when you get, you're going close to zero, it's getting more and more complicated. Meaning that if you amplify the Julia set and try to see in a little ball around zero, you're going to get things that get more and more dense in the complex plane. So as, as you do uh, amplification, you get essentially uh, uh, the Julia set starts spreading everywhere. So this kind of complication is the first hint of the, compl uh, the complicated geometry uh, near zero for this kind of dynamics, and it comes from this interaction of dynamics in different scales. Now, <coughs> the basic questions that uh, are, are going to be interest here is kind of very natural. Uh, 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 is what's going to be the geometry of this set, the set that, the co that, that comes from kind of non-scaping dynamics, or which actually is a dynamics that contains several copies of itself, infinitely many copies of itself. And the most basic questions that you get once you get um, this kind of fractal set is what's the Lebesgue measure first? Is it possibly Lebesgue measure? And uh, what's its dimension? Is it possibly of dimension two since it's very complicated and still of Lebesgue measure zero? Or uh, maybe it has dimension less than two. So those are kind of very basic questions once you have a fractal set like this. And that's what we uh, try to, uh, and it's when you ask this question that you get to, uh, to the other part of the talk that you, we get to have to understand what's a Poincare series of those maps. And uh, that's where we come to. So let's see what's Poincare series, but starting from how they were introduced. So I went to get 
uh, it's not a good quality. I took some scan that was read in the internet on the archive, but uh, so anyway, so this is the, uh, 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 I try to look where, where it's defined. This is uh, in the first paper that uh, Brinka Haig did about uh, Hertzian functions. So it's a paper that precedes the paper about uh, Hertzian groups uh, that he did because he was interested in Hertzian groups because of those Hertzian functions and uh, not uh, the other way around. So anyway, uh, here is, uh, uh, in this article, he, he, inter he defined those uh, Franca Hay theories and uh, you see here the motivation. So that's why uh, I put here and uh, you see that it is, uh, that he's looking for uh, function, uh, functions that are analogous to elliptic functions with the goal of integrating uh, linear differential equations with uh, algebraic coefficients. And to do this, he comes to the need to construct his uh, function functions that he's going to define. And what, what are those? So, uh, so we are going to see, uh, see here. So here's the motivation, why he's going to be doing this, and in particular, why he's doing the point of series. And I give you, uh, in the same article in the third page now, he's going to get, uh, let's see here. So in this third article, in, in the th third page, he just comes to this. So, uh, so those Hertzian functions that he wants to define, uh, he defines uh, uh, quickly as being the functions. So you are going to have a group of items. So you have the hyperbolic, the Poincaré disk, right? And you have a group, discrete group. So you have the point, uh, the, the point of the disk, it is a model for the uh, hyperbolic plane and you consider hyperbolic motion in this plane and uh, that, gen that generates a, a, a discrete group. And he's looking, so you have this kind of uh, gamma, the discrete group of symmetries. And what he's going to call Hertzian functions are functions in D that are invariant uh, uh, under gamma. So that's just what is a uh, Hertzian function. So just uh, F of gamma Z is equal to F of Z. That's what he's going to define. It's uh, a little bit in the first page of the article that he does that. And here he defines something else, which is a function that he calls a theta function, uh, theta function, function which is some, some kind of function that you transform. It should not be invariant, but it should transform according to some rule, right? Which is going, well, the rule is written there, which is uh, we recognize the rule as being uh, some uh, rule that so, so actually the theta function function. Transforms as a differential form. So the, it involves some power of the derivative and it is what is required. So uh, a function function is a function that's defined on the quotient of the, by the group, and uh, uh, a theta function function will be something that's a, a, of weight. So he, he, the theta function function has a weight that's an integer m, and it will be something that transforms, uh, that defines a, a, a holomorphic form or meromorphic form in um, in the quotient surface. So, uh, yeah, and then uh, this kind of. Uh, interesting situation, naturally, natural, we, we would be interested uh, perhaps first on the geometry of Hertz, uh, Hertz. Uh, his interest on the functions that you can define there. And uh, just to recall that uh, it's certainly very interesting to consider because uh, this kind of uh, functions, because actually all Riemann, almost all Riemann surface arise as quotient by a uh, Hertzian group. So that there's the uniformization theorem that uh, tells us that. And so he's describing actually something very general at the level of Riemann surface or the so uh, the, the point that just after, so that's just the definition of theta function. And then uh, in the next paragraph, he says how to construct a function that has those properties and he writes that formula, which is uh, a Poincaré series. So that's what, uh, what appears as a Poincaré series. It's kind of summing, he considers a sum over the object of the group. So you, you, he starts with some function A, I write in a, modern language, and then you apply uh, elements of the group. I write like this, 
and then you divide by uh, some power n, and he sums over all elements of the group. And when you apply some elements of the group to, it, uh, to that, then you see how this is transformed, and immediately it comes the, the property of, uh, of the tra the, how it changed under those coordinates. So that's the, the way to, he defines a Poincaré series. And a little bit after, so this kind of, how to construct those kind of uh, invariant forms, and to recover the Pustrian function, he takes the quotient of two Poincaré series of the same weight. So that's a way to get from, a, from all this to finally get some, uh, some functions also. So, uh, so, so that's what, what I'm doing. I'm not going to continue very much on, uh, on uh, how, how those things uh, develop, but he looked at them, uh, of course, has to show that things are actually converging. So he writes the series, the group's infinite. And uh, there's a question of whether this uh, converts or not. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, it's easy to see that uh, those big gamma uh, of z is a sequence that tends to increase, so it's bigger than one for, except for uh, finitely many uh, uh, values of infinite many gamma. So the question is, uh, the lower the n is uh, the easier the convergence. And uh, he considers the condition n bigger or equal than two. Uh, and he's doing, he's doing everything here, uh, holomorphic function, so everything's restricted to integers. And he proves convergence in this case. He actually proves convergence of the absolute Poincaré series, which is what you get if you plot absolute values here. So this would be the absolute Poincaré series. Same thing. So you get something like this. So he proves this. What he gets when you do this, that uh, at this level, and, and let's put here n equals two, that's the hardest case that to consider. It is, in this case, you are coming from a quadratic differential to an area form. And basically, uh, the argument for convergence is just saying that the point of this has, uh, in the Euclidean matrix, it has finite area. So uh, that's kind of not very difficult to do, to, to, to establish this convergence. So here is the, uh, so here's uh, basically what, uh, uh, how we would understand this. And uh, okay, so that, that's that much for uh, his original. Then he did many things. So he wrote several articles on, uh, on this. So that later on he, write, he decides that uh, he actually has to understand a little bit better the groups in order to say a lot of things about the functions. He writes a paper about uh, called the theory, theory of uh, theory de groups of Jean, and uh, which he says explicitly there that uh, motivation there is preparation for uh, his next article that's about those Pustrian functions. So he develops this quite, uh, quite lengthy, but I'm going to jump over here. Well, first, just the, the, the point is that Poincaré series was a way to get some kind of uh, holomorphic function, in this case of Miromorph, that transforms in appropriate way. So in this case, by this kind of power of the derivative. And then 90 years later, uh, there is, uh, let, let's skip all this, uh, a Patterson, he uh, considered the problem of creating other geometric, uh, some other, not, not any more functions, but uh, measures that transform in appropriate way also. And he wanted, to, he, he wanted to construct these associated to a function group. And in order to construct those, those functions, he came with using, again, a point array series. So you're not going to be any more interested on uh, holomorphs of the objects, but only on, uh, so So you're going to be interested now, uh, not on, on this kind of objects, so you're going to consider absolute Poincaré series only. So what he considers is, uh, so you have a Pustrian group, and you see, let me show a picture of a Pustrian group. If, if I just take some of those pictures from Wikipedia, they're not kind of fantastic. <laughs> so uh, here's one simple one. Uh, so here, this is a very simple group that's acting on the Poincaré disk, and it gives a little bit notion of the orb. So as you iterate, you more or less follow this kind of complicated network. And what uh, he considers is, so Patterson, he, so everything kind of going to infinity as you iterate. So he wants to put a measure on it at infinity, at the circle at infinity. And to do this, he starts putting point masses at an orbit, so with certain weight. So he puts point mass at 
particle orbit. with weights that are, are related to the Poincaré series. It's basically, it, I would take just the Poincaré series weight. He, for some reason, he considers a different weight because he's looking at a slightly different uh, problem, but let's put the Poincaré series weight. And, well, then you better measure what's defined in the disk. He wants to measure that's defined at infinity. Then he considers, so of course, you, you have a choice of weight, and now, uh, since now you're considering point ma at mass at a fixed O, so weight of those, will be some d gamma of uh, uh, weight at gamma z, at gamma z, you put, put, let's say, one over d gamma z to the m, let's say, where now m can be real, scale of real weight. So you put this, and he gets interest on, uh, and, and in order to get something that escapes to infinity, he considers the exponent, the critical exponent, so now, we consider the point the absolute point series again. Now, there's one here, so it's a kind of notion of, let's look at this point series, and you look at the moment where it's kind of barely infinite. So it, it, can, be, it, can, it can be finite, it can be infinite, so let's look at the moment we, where it's kind of uh, a little bit undecided, so should an um, critical So that for, uh, let's call it, uh, let's call this delta. So that for n bigger than delta, you have convergence. And for n less than delta, you have divergence. So then for n bigger than delta, you get some kind of finite mass here that you can normalize. So then you can normalize if the Poincaré series, the absolute Poincaré series converge. You have a measure on the disk. Now, as you approach the, uh, the undecided parameter, those measures, sometimes with a little bit of uh, trickery, you can make those measures escape to infinity and give rise to something that's supported at the boundary. So at the critical exponent, Exponent, you get something that measure at infinity. So that's how uh, Patterson did. Uh, there are a lot of things to, to discuss here, but uh, uh, point is this was quickly generalized to the setting of um, a Kleinian groups by uh, Sullivan. went to high dimensions, considering. Uh, no, so Puck and groups arise as kind of uh, hyperbolic motions in a hyperbolic plane, and now you can consider an hyperbolic space, for instance. So if you consider the same, uh, so high dimensional case, so if you consider this, uh, what you get is, uh, well, you can do it in dimension, but if you consider in dimension, three uh, hyperbolic space, you get something that's called the Kleinian group. Which is this. So just, uh, I, I took the opportunity to look here. So here's the, play, the paper where Kleinian groups are kind of named. So basically what you have is that uh, you have Puckton groups that are uh, kind of, there are motions that have the form, uh, so the hyperbolic symmetries have always this form. And he considered, uh, since it was the situation where it have to preserve the unit disk, and now you remove this restriction. So now the circle uh, is no longer uh, some condition relative and such fundamental. So now the circle is not anymore uh, there. And you consider all transformations of the Riemann sphere, and you consider again all possible motions that you have. And since the Riemann sphere is the boundary now of the hyperbolic space, this corresponds precisely that one dimension up from what uh, is the Puckton case. So he extended this theory of uh, Patterson. It's, uh, it led to some kind of considerable, uh, uh, well, it's, there's considerably more than, uh, uh, and this is something that was developed uh, through, through many years to kind of uh, understand as well. So basically, uh, you're going to be interested on how this kind, so, sorry, 
I should have read my notes, that uh, I didn't say why, what you can do with those measures. So basically, the point was uh, already in part of them that by analyzing those measures, you get to understand things like the dimension of the limit set. So the orbits here, they are going to some uh, limit set at infinity. And uh, I, I saw some, uh, some uh, 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 there was in this drawing, it seemed to have the limit set that was everything, but it could be uh, something else. And uh, you get in general some kind of fractal set at infinity. And you can ask exactly those questions of dimensions. And those questions, they are going to be uh, related. To study this, it's interesting to consider precisely those geometric measures. They give you some, uh, some information about, uh, about the behavior there. And particularly, uh, the critical exponent is a way uh, to compute dimensions, at least in several cases. So uh, what he, uh, so, so but then what happens in the case of Kleinian groups? How, how you actually say something about the critical exponent and about those measures? Turns out that it depends a lot on the geometry of the three manifolds. So if you go one dimension up, you are going to have now the quotient of the hyperbolic space by the Kleinian group will give rise to a three manifold, hyperbolic three manifold. And it is uh, the theorems that are shown is that depending on the geometry of the three manifold, you are going to get different properties of the critical exponent and of the, uh, of the geometric measures. So the first results are kind of by Sullivan and Takia, so which give an estimate on the point of high. So I am in the Klein and group case, well, separated. Uh, and they show that uh, the critical exponent was less than two when the, the surface, uh, the, the, the manifold was simple, in simple case. Which are the geometrically finite case. I can't give uh, very much idea so, so of how the geometry comes in, but frequently, it comes down to properties of Brownian motion and the recurrence properties of Brownian motion in this manifold that uh, are going to be exploited in uh, the kind of results. The, most, the one that I really look at a little bit more, uh, which kind of closer to what you have here, is uh, the theorem about what happens in the geometrical infinite case. So this is kind of uh, relatively recent because it combines many things, but you know now, uh, so the geometrical infinite case. you have uh, actually, you know that delta is equal to this, the critical exponent. So this is kind of a very uh, complicated result that's actually due to Bishop Jones plus the alpha conjecture. It's kind of a funny, Funny thing, I said that the critical exponent is related to the dimension, and that uh, basically it is, but uh, it's, there is a problem when the Lebesgue measure is, uh, of the limit set is, is positive. So the Alpha's conjecture was proved by, uh, uh, I think, Scaligari, Gaib, Gabay, and, uh, and Agol, uh, and this is uh, from uh, six years ago or something like this. So this Alpha's conjecture is the statement that uh, the Lebesgue set the Lebesgue measure of the limit set is zero. So we have this fractal set and to establish first that the Lebesgue measure is zero. And then Bishop Jones had shown that uh, in all case where the Lebesgue measure was zero, then the critical exponent was two. So there's a, and this kind of, so they, here they prove this leg zero. And basically the point of this argument where Lebesgue measure equals zero appears is because uh, it ensures that some, uh, well, basically, the problem that would be created by positive back measure would be that the Brownian motion would run away through the geometrically infinite end of the, of the manifold. If this happens, it will create at the same time positive back measure and uh, it, it will create some problems of the, with the critical exponent. So, but they block this uh, possibility because of this alpha conjecture. And uh, you can say that to understand essentially everything about at least the critical exponent in the case of Kleinian groups. All right, so that's kind of the, the situation. Now you ask, what about the renormalization fixed points that were in, in the beginning? So there is something that's called 
uh, Sullivan's dictionary that uh, tries to create a parallel between uh, Kleinian groups and uh, Lamarck. So Kleinian groups are some kind of Lamarck dynamics, of course, but of a, of a group. Uh, on one hand, each element of the dynamics are relatively simple because there may be transformation. So it's not very complicated when you iterate, but uh, you have a whole group of them. Now, if you have a single Lamarck map that's actually really nonlinear, then just by iterating it, you already get lots of complexity, as in the pictures that I showed in the beginning. So the point was that uh, there is this dictionary that kind of tells you some, some equivalence between both theories, and that sometimes descends to the level of proof. You can kind of translate, kind of you translate one result to the other, and hope that you prove some result in one part, and then you translate it back to the other case. And now you can try to get lots of theorems just by filling lines in this dictionary. And it works very well in some case, like, uh, uh, well, so we won't talk, but uh, he just translated, it got immediately several uh, interesting parts. Uh, but in some other cases, less uh, clear. So you can try to look at, for renormalization fixed point, if there is a line in the dictionary that, uh, that answers for it. And uh, then you see that, uh, uh, according to Macmillan, there are some manifolds that are going to uh, be, uh, uh, well, Macmillan was implementing these uh, kind of uh, things, and uh, he wrote a book, at least, that was called uh, Renormalization and Three Manifolds that fi which Fiber Over the Circle. So there is some class in it, you get that there is some class of manifolds that are going to be geometrically infinite, which, uh, so uh, basically I'm, uh, I'm saying that uh, renormalization fixed point Fixed point will correspond to some kind of geometrical, some, not, not a general geometrically infinite manifold, but some specific kind. This type of geometrically infinite manifold. And accordingly to this uh, uh, idea, you can hope that you can get a proof that uh, uh, the geometric pro properties of the Julia set, so the dictionary says that Julia set, of course, it corresponds to the limit set for a Kleinian group. So this is a clear line in the dictionary. Uh, so you can imagine that the geometric properties of the Julia set will kind of reflect, will be the, get the same answers that you get in the case of Kleinian groups. So then you can go on and, and try to translate this. But there's a problem because in Kleinian groups you have a three manifold. And for rational maps or, or, or for polynomials or whatever, uh, you don't have a three manifold. So you cannot run those arguments in one dimension bigger and particularly where you're going to run your Brownian motion in part of your argument. So some, there was some uh, hope that you could construct three dimensional objects that would be so kind of tame that you'd allow to run those arguments that work on three manifolds. Those are, would be some uh, laminations, which kind of gets more complicated, but you have lamination by three-dimensional uh, manifolds with three-dimensional leaves. So it constructs those, gu those guys and with the hope of getting there. But those have very complicated behavior, and technically it was not possible to, 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 to make the argument work. You try to translate the proofs, and uh, it was kind of, at least several years ago, it was not developed enough to, to do that. Okay, so since this looks a little bit complicated, uh, we can try to do it a little bit differently. So after all, we don't need, uh, I kind of took you all for some kind of hide at uh, this uh, Kleinian group, but now you forget them, and look again at the point high theory. So, the, uh, so what the point high theory is here, you just, uh, so point high theory is you just write the same thing. Instead of having all those gamma, you just have a, a semi-group generated by a single map. So you're just going to have now DFM. So you, you run over all the map guys that go there. That's the thing Y equals W equals Z. And then sum over N. Okay. And now you put W, uh, w. Then you put gamma. Yeah, there, okay. So you look at this point of the you get convergence, again, area ethnic for delta equals two. And you can try to show that uh, you investigate first if it also converged for some delta less than two. So, but you have a series here. You can try to just kind of uh, make it converge by hand. Problem is that uh, as you have this kind of self-similarity, you have copies of the dynamics here. So things get very complicated as you get ne 
they are zero. We don't have some properties that are kind of good, like a carbonist and so on. You, you, you see more and more complications, and uh, it's unclear how to deal with what's happening on zero. If you kind of only had things that run away from zero, then you'd be fine. Well, you, you, there's some way to kind of put your hands around this and kind of say a little bit of things. So the fact that it's converging somewhere, you like it to perturb a little bit and get a few conversions. And the point is that uh, we have to use that uh, the self-similarity here, so the, the functional equation, gives some kind of, uh, 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 gives some kind of, uh, that has a reflection on the internal structure of the Poincaré series. So you can see that the Poincaré series, if you start expanding from using the chain rule, you are going to see copies of the Poincaré series inside itself because you just expand here and an orbit can be decomposed in two orbits. So you have some kind of here that multiply another. Everything's multiplicative, so everything looks fine. So you can start expanding term and decomposing orbits in several ways and exploring the functional equation. And you come up with some kind of uh, Poincaré series that sees itself which gives uh, uh, the, the recursion equation. Uh, it's not a, 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 an equality, it's not exactly formal, but it's a, an inequality, so in the estimate. So you have a recursive, ex recursive estimate that you get from saying uh, the Poincaré series on both sides, which has the form uh, Poincaré series of F, let's say, uh, th there are kind of inequalities in both sides, but it has some, there are coefficients. For some reason, it looks quadratic. Uh, something like this. Or P delta, P delta of X plus. So there are coefficients A delta, B delta, C delta, which appear as truncations of this. So it's some kind of partial information here that avoids a neighborhood of zero. And then by pick, picking up the copies of the Poincaré series, you can see that the whole structure comes uh, to that, essentially. So that's, uh, that's a formula that uh, we computed in uh, uh, several years ago, in uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, me and uh, uh, Misha Lilbit. And with this formula, we were able immediately to get a, a first counterexample, a first thing showing that the dictionary is not going so well at this moment. Because, uh, for instance, uh, we can, we, so you have to say something about those, those coefficients. And uh, <coughs> let us see, uh, well, okay, so let me give a connection with probability. Uh, those coefficients here also have some scale. The, the, the way that I produce this recursive estimate is associated to considering some scales, so, so coefficients. Coefficients involve truncation at some scale. So there are several possible scales of truncation. As long as you truncate, you get something that makes sense, but uh, you, you, you can get different recursive equations involve different things. And th so when you analyze those coefficients for delta equals two, you see that the coefficient for several scales, for different scales, they are kind of computed basically, and uh, 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 the way they behave is just reminds us some parameters in a random walk. So you have a random walk on the line, and you're looking at things that behave like, uh, like probabilities to jump from one side to the other side after many steps without passing through some other place. So there's things that say that things are going that direction or things going that direction. And the coefficients for different scales are exactly the, 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 the probabilities of uh, doing certain things from one lattice point to the other. So you get again some probabilistic things for delta equals two. And, uh, and the idea to take delta equals two because you're only trying to decide dimension two or not at first. And you can try to compute perturbatively what's happening to the, this, the, this point ahead series uh, at that value. And then if you get some good contour, you're going to at least decide this question. Anyway, uh, there is kind of reflections to, uh, to this uh, uh, pr uh, random uh, mechanism that have uh, uh, appears also in the Klein and Gold case. But anyway, here, to gov govern this, you need this kind of uh, uh, point of reform. 
And you can ask them, all right, so there are those coefficients, it's just an inequality. What's actually happening? Uh, it turns out that while in the Kleinian group, there was some kind of mysterious reason that makes everything uh, become, get, get a universal answer, what happens in the, uh, uh, in the case of uh, renormalization fixed points is that the initial geometry here, so what you get in terms of those initial coefficients corresponding to some truncation, will determine the whole behavior of the random walks. So you can see that, uh, 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 as I understand, there is some accident that may happen corresponding to some scales. I don't see why the, uh, those things are very important because uh, what matters really is what's happening at the critical point. But some things that happen in kind of outer scale, far away from the critical point, influence and determine what's going to happen to the, uh, uh, as you start putting all scales together. You can't do this in Kleinian groups. You can't put some complications and change the behavior. And it seems that here it is possible. So we didn't get this right away. What we proved was that uh, it's possible, so, in, so it was published in 2008, that uh, it is possible to have house of dimensions equal to the critical exponent uh, less than two, which says that uh, this path is already not going through this line of the dictionary. So, this is done by, uh, uh, by, by, by actually checking that those coefficients can behave in a certain way. And then uh, we kind of said several things about the geometric measures and so on. But what we couldn't decide at that time was whether you can get, so, so this corresponds basically to this random walk that I mentioned, the drifting in one direction. There are two directions here that are, you imagine that there's this tower of scales and there are, and there are points that are, live in different scales and they can kind of move up or they can move down, they can move closer to the critical point on, or away. And, uh, and you have to see wh wh what kind of drift you have for this random walk. And you check that uh, it was possible to have drift away from the critical point. And in this case, this led to uh, delta less than two. You can imagine that uh, away is like the geometrically finite end and inside the geometrically infinite end. And uh, just, uh, I'm going to finish. So we recently, we managed to prove that uh, it's possible, so now, so recently, so right now, we now know that, uh, for that, uh, that uh, it's possible to construct things, so to get some kind of, uh, there are only countably many parameters that you have, so there are countably many fixed points, but it's possible that there exists uh, some case where the Lebesgue measure is positive. So it also the analogous of the Alpha's conjecture for those manifolds uh, uh, is not going to go through uh, for the renormalization fixed point. And uh, just to say, so this is done, uh, I'm going to just, um, well, maybe it's not necessary. I have some pictures that show a little bit how this random walk changes as you change the parameters. Uh, I just say that uh, this is uh, the actual proof of this. We involve another renormalization theory uh, also that uh, is a different one that allows us to control what happens to, to the parameters as you make some parameter go to infinity and you can see the generation of the drift in one direction. So anyway, so that's the, the conclusion, but uh, just uh, so, so basically that kind of completely sense of this uh, point of absolute point of his series in this uh, to get all those reasons. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? The random walk, uh, well, you, you have to, if in our paper that we do this, uh, this, this analysis of Poincaré series, it is, it appears some formulas that are for those coefficients. So you see clearly, I don't know if you kind of explicitly say this, but you recognize that you see that the parameter, we give the, the formulas relating the parameters at different scales. So there's a sequence of parameters, a, a eta, and uh, we call it the eta n and psi n. And you see that uh, just by the formulas, some of them are kind of decay exponentially while the other is bounded or, or is the opposite or otherwise there is no drift and then they decay harmonically. So you identify those exactly as those probabilities that I mentioned. What's the probability of jumping? So there are three cases actually. Uh, actually, I, I wanted to mention this, that uh, I mentioned that it's possible to have house of dimension less than two in the back measure pose. This corresponds to two kinds of drift. You may wonder whether it's possible to have house of dimension two and the back measure zero. This corresp would correspond to a random walk that has no drift. 
And uh, my opinion is that uh, this is kind of an unknowable problem because uh, in my view, these kind of coefficients are kind of, have some kind of accident on them. So they, those are accidents that happen for, for the large scale that have nothing to do with what's happening at the critical point of some universal behavior. And you, it's like asking whether a given real number that comes there, like, uh, I don't know, the time structure constant or whatever, is it a rational number? It's kind of uh, completely, uh, so that, that there is this open question, whether, the, but I, I'm quite convinced that's not at all uh, knowable. Yeah, yeah. You can, uh, I think, you can get it uh, in my, uh, well, it has to be in, in our paper because it's the only place that's done. So then there's our 2008 paper where there is uh, this. But in the Klein and Group case, there is more, uh, more things. You can see actually the Brownian motions, I think. Here, it, it behaves like a, a, a So, so you have uh, points that are basically. Uh, no, no. What is the space in which there is a random walk? Well, random we just have in the plane. So in the plane, you have all. The, uh, so you have. Random walk on the plane. So yes, but the, plane. but under the dynamics. So the dynamics takes points uh, from so near zero. The, the, the Actually, measure double measure on the plane. Random walk really is a double measure on the plane. So you have Lebesgue measure, yeah. and now you have points uh, that may be close to the critical point no, or the. No, no, no. It's in, the, it's in the plane. Yes. So there is a random walk on the plane, which has some things in there. Well, it's highly dependent on the condition because a random, random walk, well, anything can be, you just have some dynamics, you can call it a random walk. But you, you, you're asking what are the probabilities that you have points that are, for instance, close to the critical point, or the probabilities that they come away from the critical point after some iteration. So that, that, that's kind of questions that no, are. Again, you say it's some, it's, uh, so you, if you produce a random walk, there's some things in it. You can say that there is a map. And there's some the, so you get a symmetry if you look at the limit of the dynamics. So you can kind of consider, you, you kind of, there is a tower construction that you have this dynamical system here, it stops at this scale, that's a, a, a upper scale here. You can kind of renormalize the dynamics and make this kind of outer this becomes larger. And then you're going to have something that, that's defining the whole, uh, well, that, that, that has a dynamics in all scales also up. And now you have these towers of dynamics and you can ask for points are moving in this tower as you iterate, you're going up or down in this. So this would correspond to the limit that you get closer and closer to the critical point. But then you just have uh, points that uh, you take with respect to the bag measure and you ask what's the tendency of what they do. Do they have a tendency to go inner in the scale or does they have a tendency to go up or away from the critical point? But with this, to make it really a random walk on some kind of, on the line instead of just half line, you have to do this procedure to, cons to, to convert this to a tower. That said, we don't kind of formally uh, introduce random walk uh, language because it's not necessary. You can just estimate things, but to remark that to understand what are th the meaning of uh, what you are doing, it's convenient to uh, to think in terms of those random walks. Other questions? Well, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Okay.